I'm going to talk a little bit about the expectant father. Now, I'm probably the last of the group of men who was not expected to be in the delivery room when their children were born. You know, from my age and older, that just wasn't something you do. Now, if you're younger than me, ah, you're right there. You know, you're catching the baby. You're doing all of this stuff. But us, no. In fact, when, when my daughter was born, the doctor was an older doctor, and he thought that it was a horrible idea for the father to be in the room. So he required a nine-week course if you were going to be in the room. And I was taking 21 college hours and working 52 hours at work. I didn't have time for a nine-week course. I thought I could talk him into it. He said no. So when my daughter was born, I'm in a waiting room. Pacing. Back and forth. Some of y'all have been there, right? Walking back and forth, back and forth. What's going on? What's going to happen? When am I going to get news? I was an expectant father. Now, as an expectant father, there's at least three things that happen. First, as an expectant father, I wanted to be found when there was news. I didn't want to hide. I didn't want them to have to hunt me. I didn't want them to have to wonder where I was. I wanted to be found. In fact, I would poke my head out the door. And if I saw a nurse walking by, I'd say, how's everything going? Because I wanted to be found at the first moment that there was news. So because I wanted to be found, the second thing is I placed myself in a place where I knew they would look for me. I didn't go to a restaurant and let them guess which one. I didn't go down to the hospital cafeteria. I stayed in the waiting room for expecting fathers. Because if you're looking for an expecting father, you're going to go to the waiting room for expecting fathers. So I put myself where they would find me. And then the third thing that happened I know we're not supposed to smoke and all that, but there were a few cigars in my pocket. And boy, when they came and said, ah, oh, you have a healthy baby girl. Who here, you want a cigar? Who here, you want a cigar? Hey, I'm a dad. <laughs> and I was letting everybody know. Can I go see? No, she'll be in the nursery in a little bit. Is she in the nursery yet? Can I go see? No. Boy, I was celebrating. I was on cloud nine. I was so excited. And all of you who have been fathers know what I'm talking about, don't you? You wanted to be found. You put yourself in a place to be found. And then when you were found because you had a child, you celebrated. You got excited. Well, I'm here today, and it's Father's Day, and I could talk about us as earthly fathers, but today I want to talk about the expectant father. Not the many, but the one expectant father. Because you see, we've got a father in heaven who is a lot like fathers waiting on their children to be born. He wants to be found. He's put himself in a place where we can find him. And when we find him, there is joy and celebration. And so as we look through scripture, we don't have to look hard to find out that God wants to be found. He wants us to find him. I'm going to read three verses real quick. Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Proverbs 8, 17. I love those who love me and those who seek me will find me. Luke eleven ten. 10. Everyone who asks receives the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks on the door, it is opened. God wants to be found. Now sometimes people don't want to be found. You see, I, I, I dated this girl when I was in college, and we dated through a semester, and we went home over the summer, and something happened over the summer. She probably found somebody better than me, which wasn't hard to do. And so I come back, but I come back convinced that I am going to re-win her, okay? 
She has just forgotten how awesome I am over the summer. And so when I get back and I can find her, then I'm going to woo her all over again and fix everything. Problem was, she didn't want to be found. <laughs> yep. She changed roommates, didn't stay in the same dorm. She quit going to the same places that we had gone to when we were dating. And it took me three weeks before I found her. And when I found her, it was very obvious she didn't want to be found. She was hiding from me. I got the message. I'm slow, but I got the message. <laughs> so I started looking for another girl. I mean, you know, us college guys are pretty easily distracted. She didn't want to be found. I think a lot of people think God is like that. I think a lot of people in our world think that God is hiding somewhere and he wants us to jump through the hoops to find him. That God doesn't really want to be found. God wants to remain mysterious. God wants to remain hidden. God wants to remain cloaked. That is not the Bible truth. The Bible truth is our expectant father wants to be found. He's done everything he can for us to find him. He's given us a whole book full of instructions on how to find me. He's given us all of the marvelous things we see in nature so that we know how to find him. He's given us his church so that we can help each other find him. He wants us to find him. And it's kind of like when you're playing hide and seek with little kids. Now, you all know as an adult, if you play hide and seek with little kids, you can hide so well they never find you, right? Because you are smarter than they are. But you're going to hide with your toes sticking out from under the curtain or with your leg out from behind the couch so that they will find you. And if they still don't find you, you're going to go... <coughs> and when they come around, you're going to go, Oh my, you found me! Because you know for them the fun in the game is finding you. Our Father knows that the glory in this life is finding Him. He's not hiding. He's not trying to distance Himself from us. He wants us to find Him. The second thing is that God is where we can find Him. He doesn't hide, but rather he reveals. Isaiah 55, 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near to you. Acts 17, 27. God did all of these things so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for them and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. Philippians 4 and 5. Let your gentleness be known to everyone, for the Lord is near. The Bible over and over and over again tells us that God is close by. That God's near to us. God doesn't just want us to find Him, but He's put Himself in a place to be found. So much like I stayed in that, that waiting room for expecting fathers, God has stayed in this world. God has stayed active in this world and God has stayed close to mankind because he wants mankind to find him. He's here. In fact, if we believe the New Testament, it says when two or three of us are gathered together, what happens? He's here. I mean, how hard is that to find? I mean, I know there's several of us here today, but if you give me the name of one of us, I bet I can find you. He's here. He wants to be found. Now, I had a friend, Richard, in college, and he had probably the most dysfunctional family from a communications perspective of anybody I'd ever seen. They just never talked. He never called home. They never called him. They saw each other at holidays. And he got to needing a little money, so he thought he would go home between holidays. He wasn't supposed to go home to Thanksgiving, but he was going to go home early. Well, he didn't call because they just didn't do that. He gets in the car and Richard drives home. And he drives up to the house and there's nobody there. I don't mean they're not home. I mean there's nothing there. There's no furniture. There's no vehicles. There's no lawnmower in the shed. And Richard starts to freak out. 
So he goes to a pay phone, because we didn't have cell phones back then. He goes to a pay phone, puts it in, dials. His mom answers. He says, Mom, where are you? She says, I'm at home. He goes, no, you're not. She goes, oh, we were going to tell you at Thanksgiving, but we moved. They had moved across town to a new house, figured that when Richard called and said he was coming home for Thanksgiving, they'd give him directions to the new house. But now can you imagine his shock when he pulls up in the driveway of home and there's nothing there? His parents weren't where he expected to find them. They were not at a place to be found. Now when he found them, it was all okay. God doesn't do that to us. He doesn't up and move on us and go, okay, you've got to find me again. When we find God, God doesn't move. God stays there. If anybody moves, it's us. And all we got to do is go back to where we found him because God is waiting for us in the place we expect him. I hear people all the time say, man, I'm having a hard time finding God. You been to church lately? No, I have not. Well, wow. <laughs> you know, I think if I was looking for God, church might be the first place I'd go to find him. Well, I, I just really wish I felt close to God. You been reading your Bible? No? Okay. It's not mysterious where God is. Now, just because we don't look where he is, we don't go to church, we don't read our Bible, we don't do things with Christian people, and we lose him, does not mean that God's not standing there going, Yoo-hoo! I'm over here. If you're looking for me, just, just look, you'll find me. God has put himself in our world, not just in a natural sense, but in a spiritual sense. That's what the church is all about. If people come to church and they don't see God in the midst of the church, it's not a commentary on God, it's a commentary on the church. Because God is in his church. He is here. The Lord is near. And finally, finding God brings us joy. Just like the father in the waiting room is there and he gets all excited when they come in and say, you got a baby boy, you got a baby girl. And everybody gets all excited. Everybody gets all... The father receiving news that his child has come home strikes the whole host of heaven the same way. They get excited. Psalm, 20, or Psalm 70 and verse 4. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. And may those who look for your saving help say... The Lord is great. And if you think David said that by accident, listen to this one. Psalm 40, 16, a different verse, but listen, it sounds awful familiar. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help say, The Lord is great. David wrote it twice. Psalm 40, Psalm 70. Why? Because God rejoices when we are found. 1 Chronicles 16.10 Glory in His holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Rejoice. One more story from my college time. Back before there were cell phones. You know now there's cell phones and, and parents check on their kids every 30 minutes on the way home, right? Where are you? Yeah, I'm in Amigan. Okay. Where are you? Oh, I'm in Tuckerman. Okay. Where are you? Oh, and, they can check, you can check. Well, no, no, when I was in college, it didn't happen that way. You called when you left. You knew how long it took to get home. It was three hours and five minutes from Harding to Oxford in that day and time. So you called. You know how long it took to get home? Three hours, five minutes, three hours, 10 minutes, three hours, 15 minutes. What do mom and dad start doing? They start worrying. They start getting a little nervous. Okay, where's, where's our kid? How come our child's not home? Bill and Susan went through that. Where's our daughter? She should have been home by now. She should have been home by now. 30 minutes after she was supposed to be home, guess what? Start calling people. Anybody seen her? Anybody heard from her? Did she stop somewhere? Do you know where she is? An hour late. They start worrying. Bill gets one of his friends. Guess what he does? They get in the car. And they start heading down the route that they knew she would be coming home. As they head down the route, they pass her. Turn around, pull over, a lot of neck hugging, a lot of crying, a lot of, oh, I'm so glad you're all right. Flat tire, waited for somebody to fix it. 
Somebody fixed it. As soon as it got fixed, back on the road. As soon as they got to a pay phone, pulled over, Bill calls home. Why does Bill call home? Because they're still worried. They don't know what's happened. We found her. She's fine. Everything's great. And you can hear over the phone the celebration. She's found. She's great. Everything's good. Now, in reality, she was never in danger, except in their mind. But you know what? It did not matter. Because when she was found, they celebrated anyway. The truth is, you and I are in danger. There's somebody who wants to take our very soul. He wants to take us away from the Father and never let us see our Father again. He wants to kidnap us. Satan wants to kidnap us. He does not want us to go home. So when we get found, the rejoicing in heaven is very, very real. Because our Father says, we found him. We got him back. He doesn't have him anymore. The angels rejoice. <coughs> we rejoice with each other. Luke 15 is probably the best known parable in the whole of the New Testament. We call it the parable of the prodigal son. I would call it the parable of the expectant father. Because you see, the son goes off, but the entire time the son goes off, the father waits expectantly. The father in this story wants to be found. He wants to be found. He wants nothing more <clears throat> than his son to find him again. And he waits in a place where he knows his son will find him. He's lost half his wealth. He gave it to the son. The other son's taken the other half of his wealth. <clears throat> and yet he does not move to a more modest home. He does not transition to a different place. He waits at this home. Why does he wait at the same home? He wants to be where his son can find him. He wants to be there. And he watches. The parable says he watches every day and when he sees his son in the distance, he doesn't wait. He runs. He runs. Embraces his son. They come home and then what happens? They celebrate. They celebrate. It's just like the waiting room of a hospital. He wants to be found. He's waiting where he can be found. And when the news comes that the son is home and alive, he celebrates. And the last verse says, when the older son complains a little about the celebration, the father says, but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and he is found. We have an expectant father. We have a father who's like one in a waiting room. We have a father who's like one who's lost a child. We have a father who wants us worse than anything else. He wants us bad enough that he sent his son to die for us so that we might be found. You think that God doesn't want us to find him? Then you have missed the whole point of the cross. The whole point of the cross is that we find God. And in finding God, we find who he made us to be. And we find life. All you fathers in here, I don't care what your child has done, where they've been, what problems they've had. If the phone rings and you hear a voice that says, Daddy, I need help. What are you going to do? You're going to roll over and go back to sleep and say, oh, well, I'll deal with that tomorrow. Is that what you're going to do? No. You're going to jump up at whatever time and you don't care what your child has done or where they've been, you don't even care if the trouble they're in is their fault. If your child calls home and says, Daddy, I need help, 
you are going to be up and out that door as fast as you can. And you are going to find them and you are going to bring them home. If we as human fathers have that kind of love and motivation for our children, how much more does a father in heaven love us? How much more if we drop to our knees and we say, Father, I need your help. Do we believe he's not going to send it? He's going to come running. Because if I look up to heaven and say, Daddy, I need your help. He's going to give me all the help he can give me. The reason we deprive ourselves of our Father's help is that we don't ask. We don't ask. We try to tough it out and do it ourselves. And how many times, those of you who have children, and my daughter's here, so she's probably getting mad at me right now, but anyway, those of you who have children, you know sometimes when your child has tried to do things by themselves, and at the end of it you thought, my goodness, I wish they had just asked me. It would have been a whole lot easier if I'd helped on the front end. I wonder how many times our Father in Heaven goes, I wish you just dropped and asked me. Invited me into the process. If you had invited me in before it got to this big a mess, it would have been a lot easier. But you know, he doesn't care. He doesn't care how big the mess is. He's coming anyway. As an earthly father, I know one thing. And I think it is the, the curse of all fathers to know. There are things you and I can't fix as a human father. There are just things we can't fix. We want to. We would do anything to fix some of the things that occur in our children's lives. Our children get sick, we'd do anything in the world to heal them. We would do anything. And there's things we can't do. But we have an expectant Father in Heaven and nothing is beyond His power. There is nothing He can't do. When we ask, He will answer. When we look, we will find. When we knock, the door will be open. If you don't know your Heavenly Father today, He's waiting. He's waiting. He's looking. He's looking down the road. You don't have to do anything except turn toward Him and He's going to be running flat out full speed toward you. And He's going to wrap you in His arms. And He will fix your life. Everything's going to be perfect, right? No. Everything won't be perfect. But you know what? Your life will be fixed. And it'll be fixed because you have a father who wants to be found. You have a father who is at a place you can find him. And you have a father that is going to celebrate like you have never seen celebration when he finds you. All you have to do is be willing to look and open the door. And he's there. If you don't know that father today, please, 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 don't leave here without finding him. If you have an earthly father who has maybe imperfectly mirrored that heavenly father, you need to throw your arms around him and thank him today. Because this world is full of a lot of fathers who have abdicated their responsibility. And this world is full of a lot of fathers who have not done their responsibility correctly. But even if you're one of those folks who did not have an earthly father who cared about you and loved you, there are men in this congregation who will be your spiritual fathers and have been, I think, to many of you. The only reason they are is that they have already found the Heavenly Father. And they are doing their best to mirror Him in their lives. And we need to praise God for godly men who don't care whose child you are. They just want to love you like a father does. If you're here today and you need help, the Father waits. He's among us. He's with us. And He cares about us. There will be some folks at the back of the room. If you don't even know where to start, Walk back there and they will show you how to talk to the Father and there will be much rejoicing. You can come while we stand and sing.